It's the Masters, the season's first major, a tradition unlike any other, and a time for players to outperform even their own high expectations. This takes focus, commitment, and trusting the best golf ball for your game. That's why the majority at Augusta National will rely on the Titleist Pro V1 or Pro V1X. They deliver superior performance, consistency, and unrivaled control. Titleist, the number one ball at the Masters, the number one ball in golf. Hello and welcome to episode 115 of The Thing About Golf, the podcast series from Golf Australia magazine exploring the eternal question of just what draws people so strongly to this game. Rod Murray's my name and this week's always a special week in golf with almost everyone who's anyone at Augusta National for the Masters. Among that crowd is our very own John Huggan who reached into his contact book and lined up some special interviews to celebrate the week as we wait for the first tee shots Friday morning Australian time. On this first of those chats, Huggy caught up with two-time Masters champion Ben Crenshaw. And if you know anything about golf and anything about the Masters, you'll know that that is always worth listening to. So enough out of me, and let's get straight to John Huggan in conversation with Ben Crenshaw. Okay, welcome to the latest edition of the Thing About Golf podcast, the special one this week, here we are at the Masters, and I'm sitting opposite uh, a man steeped in Masters history. He's even got his green jacket on just for us. Ben Crenshaw, what was and is the thing about golf for you? John, it's, I was introduced to the game at an early age. Um, my father played golf. My brother, 15 months older, played golf, and we fell into a group of young kids who wanted to play, but we were guided by a man named Harvey Penick, who gave us a great gift. To, he encouraged us to play, but he wanted us to be in the game and learn how to say nice things to the members right. and learn to get along socially. Yeah. Uh, I, I look back at, at the game, and I, especially during a week like this, I see people all over the world that I played with and played against. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I just saw Roger Davis this morning from Australia. Mm -hmm. We played many times down there. and It makes me understand that it's a worldwide game. People have had love for it for hundreds of years. Uh, there's a lot to be learned about it every day you play. Mm -hmm. Um I think it's the social aspect of the game that's as lasting right. and tradition. Yeah. Uh, there's no other game like it. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I just did a small piece for Royal Dornock. Right. Okay. And to think that golf was played in the 1600s yeah, there, I know. Yeah. Uh, it's very much attributed to – to to your country, Scotland, that makes it what it is. It's yes, it's competition, but it's it's enjoyment of the game. But but it's it's respect for the rules. Fourteen fifty seven, yeah, an act of Parliament, yeah. Uh, Largely the same today. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to get to this much later in this interview, but since you bring that aspect of the game up, do you think some of that is being lost at the moment because of the way things are, especially at the top end of the game where you were involved? Well, I think, John, if anything, right now, I, I'm, I have to be real honest. I'm very unsettled with things yeah. in the world. I think we all are, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say a few things about Jackie Burke mm. tomorrow night, who lived to be 100 years of age. Yeah. He's, he told me – he had, was such a sage about so many things. He yeah. said, you know something, Ben? He said, if people went by the rules of golf, there wouldn't be the problems that we have today. That's a fair point. But, because if you break a rule, there's a penalty involved. Yeah, yeah. It's just that simple. Yeah, and you would own up to it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's I don't I don't see that so much anymore but yeah. we as golfers understand that and we and we believe in it. Mm -hmm. We want to carry it on. Yeah. And uh, but I, I must I'm, I share your your worries if you like. I mean 
the the way the the live golf thing and the PGA Tour and the European Tour. I mean, the, the viewing figures should be telling them something. I mean, people are switching off in droves right now, and you know they're a bit turned off by all this talk of money from people who are already multi-millionaires. You know, that's the last thing you want to hear if you're struggling a little bit. I, I, I'm, yeah. I must say, I think you know me. I'm pretty sentimental about the game. Mm. I think the thing that's most hurtful to me are the friendships that have been broken yeah. about it. Those, mm. uh, in other words, the lasting things. You know, mm. they can talk about money, they can talk about this and that, but when you talk about where you are in life and how you, what your occupation is, and how far you've come in the game, you don't want to see those relationships go away. Mm. I'm very traditional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somebody said to me earlier this morning when I said to them I'm doing a podcast with Ben Crenshaw, the reaction was, "Well, try not to make him cry." <laughs> As the old saying goes, uh, "I can I cry at supermarket openings." <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah. I do. Um, do you think a lot of this, what, the way you are, comes from Harvey Penick? In very much so. Yeah, he was a very soft-hearted man. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he so respectful about other people. Um, I never met a kinder gentleman in, in my life. Mm-hmm. And I, I like to think that the lady pros who went to him, you can't believe the way they talked about him yeah. in their career. Betsy Rawls and Mickey Wright and all, all these, Kathy Whitworth. Uh, they all, every one of them just said, what, what yeah. a kind person. Yeah, I, I went to see him way back in the day when I was at, over here at Golf Digest and with Bud Shrake, he, he, yes. Bud, who did the Little Red Book. And the, there was a problem with, Harvey had a problem with me in that he was a bit deaf, as you well know, and my accent didn't help. And he couldn't understand a word I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny. Bud Shrake did one of the best jobs of... Yeah personifying who he was in, in words and their he put together a beautiful little book and their little red yeah. book and it's universal yeah uh that's the kind of person he was mm-hmm. yeah i mean it was a, a, a enormous fun talking to him he, as i said he had, he struggled a bit with me but it, it was great it was a really good story i mean he was a lovely man as you say and obviously he loomed large in a sad way obviously when you won your second masters um, it was surreal. Dan Jenkins' oh. opening line of his story when you won there is still lived with me. He's in, a, in a big blow to atheists everywhere <laughs> was his opening it. line. <laughs> really really good. Jenkins yeah, absolutely. Um, but how do you explain that? I mean, you, you're getting into you know mysticism almost that week. I, I, there's no way to explain it. I, I do know this that at certain times that that last round. I felt like I was reverting back to just playing like a kid again, mm-hmm. which was what a time to have that sort of feeling. Well, I've and had I, pros tell me that, that they spend their working lives trying to get back to playing the game the way they played as a kid. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I was like, uh, it was a reactionary. I was just playing each shot and not getting involved with too many in ex- extraneous thoughts. Yeah. It's just, I don't know how you can explain things like that, but I, I do know at the end, I finally, I just said to myself, you know, uh, that was in honor of Harvey. And, and it just happened to be me that was helping people remember Harvey Peanut. Yeah, and that, yeah. for that, I'll always be proud. Yeah. I remember Chuck Cook, who you all know well, <clears throat> telling me back then that he was on the plane with you and Tom Kite when you went to back to Austin for the funeral the week of the Masters, and he said that you were you know in bits, and yeah. Tom was more stoic. I mean, people handle these kind of things differently. There's nothing no wrong or right, but and Chuck had in his mind you missing the cut and Tom having a chance to do well, and it was completely the opposite in the end. Oh, I was very observant of <laughs> yeah, him, yeah. and I, he knew he knows us both, and that's the way we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I. <laughs> To flip the script there is just amazing. But I, I just when you when you play your best, you just don't have these thoughts. Mm-hmm. You just react, yeah. and it just happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing thing to see. I mean, you know, to experience it must have been incredible. Anyway, I've jumped ahead of my order of play here, as it were. Um, I want to go back to you know we touched on the beginning of your you know you playing with your dad and all the rest of it, but you were a complete prodigy. As a youngster, I mean, is that fair to say? I mean, you were 
cleaning up at that age? Well, I, I, I think it really helped of having junior golfers around you that you you know you got it in your mind's eye how to play and what they those kids were doing at mm. the time and you knew who was playing the best it pushed you you said well god you know if i i, I need to play better i need to do this these things better i as i say t- well texas was a hotbed of some really good golf at mm. younger ages i remember going to you know junior high tournaments high school tournaments and then to go to the state junior tournament in san antonio at brackenridge park for the texas state junior you could see these kids from around the state and you said oh these guys can really play yeah it helps you to to see that mm-hmm. helps your competitive juices and uh i just kept but was you stood bringing out, along you stood I, out even amongst all that though well, I, I, I was no, playing. Put your false modesty aside I, here for a minute. I, I was playing good golf. <laughs> yeah. I was playing good golf. My and my dad was a good player. Uh, he uh, was a good athlete. He played baseball. He was a catcher at Baylor University, but he obviously knew Harvey very well. But um, kept me on the right track. He wasn't hard as nails on me, but he kept pushing mm. in the right way. Um, but I was learning. Uh, I was learning. And, and adaptability and how to not only play well in Austin, Texas, but start to, start to go to different places and, and how to react. Yeah. So it was helping as a, yeah. I mean, as a rule. It, it says a lot for Harvey Penick. I mean, many things you, great things you could say about him. But the, the fact that he taught you and Tom Kite, two very different people, very different golfers, and was able to be successful with both. I mean, you know, that's the mark of a great teacher, isn't it? He, just yeah. a wonderful man. He said, Tommy, he said, I'll see you on the practice tee, and Ben, you just go play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he knew I I, I kind of enjoyed practice, not near as much as Tom. Tom is still yeah, hitting golf I'm balls sure these days. Yeah. <laughs> and I still love to play. Yeah. And uh, that's just the way we were. Mm-hmm. Now, the first thing that people – if I say Ben Crenshaw to the average golf fan, the first thing that's going to come into their head is putting. Could you always putt? Did I, that just... I, I really enjoyed putting. Yeah. And it was funny. As a kid, I would somehow I would go out and play and always end up on the putting green. And there was these four gentlemen who were always putting in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And I kept watching them, and, you know, and Harvey would come down and he said, Ben <coughs> – that's what I want you guys to do. Play, play your round and come. I want you to end up on the putting green and putt against each other. Make it a game. Yeah. Uh, putt for for something, whether it was a Coca Cola or yeah. whatever. And I just kept. I loved it. I enjoyed putting. I enjoyed trying to figure out breaks and the strength of a hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and putting against good people too, but. Yeah. Once again, that competition in some form helps you. Yeah, I, I don't see many people, ironically, putting the way that you did these days. You, you, it's old-fashioned the way you putted. Yeah, you know? it is. Yeah, yeah, I love to watch a ball break. Yeah. I was always trying to keep the ball on the high side. Yeah. In other words, Harvey said, give luck a chance. Yeah. That's one of his favorite yeah, yeah. things. Yeah. Was. Some people were bold putters. Uh, I never saw – two more bold putters than Tom Watson and Arnold Palmer. Mm. I mean, they were always forceful. Yeah. And I was more of a die putter. Uh, there's a lot of different ways. I, I think growing up on Bermuda grass greens, mm. uh, some uh, coarseness yeah. helped you make the ball roll on them. And I, I thought, God, the first time I saw some bent greens, I couldn't believe how good they were. Mm. And I said, yeah. God, this is this it's is easy. fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But no. Yeah. And did that help you here? Oh. The fact that you were, I mean, obviously, putting is such a big part of this tournament. I mean, it must have been an advantage for you. It does. You know, yeah. I, I I played nine holes yesterday, and some of the putts that you have, there's no other better feeling when you're in contention, John, than to retrieve a two putt from an odd place. Mm. It gives you such confidence yeah. to save a stroke and keep going, but you have to. You have to. These greens are most imaginative in the world. Uh, it's 
part of the huge defense of the golf course. It has everything to do with combating length mm. uh, and how you play it and how you position the ball in the fairways. Is, is the green, but the, the greens are green, unbelievable. Yeah, are they, is it more so now? Are they faster, appreciably faster now than when you played? I'll, I'll tell you this. I felt a little firmness in the ground yesterday. Mm-hmm. I was here three weeks ago on a holiday with a few friends, and uh, they're much different today. They're polished. Right. And uh, I hope we don't get any more moisture. But uh, you have to imagine, you have to know these greens. It takes a long time to mm-hmm. learn. That's why Fuzzy Zeller's win. Yeah. Without he just listened to his caddy. Mm-hmm. I think the guy's name was Jeremiah. Right. But that's one of the great caddy. Yeah. They always have great names. The trips caddies, of all time. You bet. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Uh, Did, have, have they gotten too fast? Some people would argue that they have. They're, they they yeah. get close. Yeah. Certain flagstick locations yeah. are are lethal. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, there's golf courses in the world. Uh, this. This was an unbelievable attempt at combining a comfortable game for a, an average player mm-hmm. and for the tournament golfer as well. You can, Jones always said you can only do that by tightening the flag sticks in, mm-hmm. in certain locations, yeah. but the tilting nature of the green. But you can play for bogeys here quite easily. You if can. If you want to. You, know, you the, can, yeah. which, which is. Yeah. It's like St. Challenge. Andrews. St. Andrews is the same. Yeah. Well, St. Andrews learned, you know, loomed large in Jones's career, and mm-hmm. he still says that that was the thinking man's course forever. You could learn. I, I, I'm one of those people at St. Andrews. I mean, you, if you played the rest of your life, you learned something about it every day mm-hmm. you played. Yeah. And there's no other course like it. Mm-hmm. You must have been licking your lips first time here then. You must have thought to yourself, like Seve did. Seve has always famously said, oh, I'm going to win here. You must have had the same kind of feeling. Well, I thought I could do well yeah. I, if I just kept patient and learning it. And uh, I had um, I had some wonderful caddies from 1972 to 1976, and that's when I met Carl Jackson. Mm-hmm. And I got together with him, and we finished second that year. Albeit a, a mile second. back yeah, yeah. of Raymond yeah. Floyd. But uh, we both... We're excited, mm-hmm. but we both uh, made sort of a pact to learn it together. Yeah. And after all, Carl grew up here in yeah. Augusta. Yeah. He first caddied in this tournament when he was 14 years old. What year would that be? That- he caddied for, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll think of him. Uh, he was 14 years old when he caddied. Yeah. Uh, but that, that he kind had of, a coat and tie on when he played. Really, I'm trying to yeah. remember who. Well, that feeling about the golf course that, that you had and Seve shared, it can work both ways. Because you were thinking, you know, the anticipation, you can get ahead of yourself a little bit. I mean, obviously you were low arm here the first two years you played. So yeah. obviously you had success, relatively speaking, early. So that must have helped, I would have thought. I, you know, a player like Seve, I know that when he first saw it, it gave him the freedom uh, to to highlight his many arsenals in his game. Mm. Long hitting, you know, strong hitting, but his touch, mm. his touch was magical. Yeah, yeah. and he it would allow him to to uh, show his skill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it played. And his he le- he relished that. Yeah, uh, unbel- and it was. I still think think that he was the most exciting player I ever saw, other than Arnold Palmer. Mm, yeah, but of course. Yeah. Playing, watching Seve was a revelation. Re- revelation to see you knew exactly what he was trying to do to the ball, mm-hmm. yeah. and he was his body language was so yeah. good. W- were you getting to the stage where almost you were almost getting a little frustrated by the time you did win? Well, I you was. Know? It was close, it, it was, and you, it, but I just knew I wasn't doing the things that I needed to yeah. do. I needed to hit better approach shots. I needed to th- drive better, do everything better. But uh, I had a hard time being patient. Mm. I'd say, but yeah, I mean the the gentle Ben um, <laughs> name. It's like uh, the big easy for Ernie. It's not quite the reality sometimes, <laughs> is it? <laughs> uh, I. 
very frustrated at times. I, my temper got the best of me at times, no no doubt. Mm. Uh, I, it's very hard to stay patient in yeah. this game. Mm-hmm. Especially on this golf course. Oh, well, you know what? To me, it's so spacious. Sometimes your mind wanders because you have that much space out mm. there in which to – the acoustics of this course, there's no other – uh, hmm. The sounds are no other, like no other course in the yeah. world. You kind of know what everybody's doing. Mm-hmm. You know what whose whose yell that was, which is kind of eerie and spooky, mm-hmm. and it makes you try different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I did a piece earlier this week that came out um, on Morris Bembridge, who fifty years ago shot sixty four in the last round here. Yeah, and I'm going. I'm doing two or three podcasts this week, and I'm going to ask this question in each one. Do you think that? The equivalent of Morris Bembridge today, who was a short hitter even relative back then, could shoot 64 on this golf course now. Uh, exceptional. It, it, there's, yeah. there's lots of added length. You know, I kept kept looking at the second hole and kept looking at the fifth hole and were appreciably longer. Uh, it is, and the seventh hole is mm. not anything like it was in the beginning. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's a very tough hole now. That would be exceptional, but I think it's not apt to come off to, with a, a person of very average length, mm. let's say. How do you feel about that? I mean, uh, it, I mean, the golf course has changed enormously over the time that you played in the Masters, or since even since then. Uh, how do you feel about that? I mean, there's there's two sides to this argument, and I wonder who are you sit on it. And they've done a heck of a job to keep up. Mm. But I, you know, in my in my career, I, I never could believe that over half the field now can pitch the ball 300 yards off the tee. Yeah. I never dreamed that that was uh, it's just totally different than mm-hmm. than my day. Yeah. But that's what you do hope though, John, is that the thought of playing the shots doesn't change and and the probability and what you want you know, in other words, the players of today and the players who played it yesterday can have some of the same same thought processes uh, as you go along. Uh, as you know, this course dares you to play shots, mm-hmm. and uh, it thrilling when it comes off and gives you confidence, but it's debilitating when it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And Jones was after a thinking man's course, and he he. He and Dr. McKenzie did a brilliant job of, of keeping it so. Yeah. I mean, they followed the principles of St. Andrews pretty closely, didn't they? I mean, big wide Uncanny. fairways. But if you drive it, you can't just drive it anywhere. You've got, And the closer you drive to the trouble, the more advantage you get with the second shot. I mean, it's, it's basic it's, stuff, but it's it's how it works, isn't it? It, it is. And yeah. it's, it's a once again a lifetime. But I think in Jones, Jones was such a brilliant mind. He said it was the one one course that required you to really think, and uh, that's what appealed to his senses, and was a great hallmark to uh, not only Jones but Dr. McKenzie. Uh, and to have something that combined once again both rewarding and uh, strategic play, touch, uh, it's it comes together here. What's your favorite shots out there? Or, and, and we'll get you to favorite what? putts I, in a minute. I, I know this, that two of my favorite greens in the world are number five and number 14. Mm. To me, because they represent St. Andrean yeah. greens. Yeah. And I, I keep, every time I get on those, both of them, I just scratch my head and I said, how did they, this is so much, the upslopes and then the tears or St. Andrews. St. Andrews mm. is very yeah, closely. I mean, the, the, that's that little slope at the front of the green. It dictates everything, doesn't it? it where you does. want your drive to be, where you want your second shot to be, you know, everything. You know. It's so Jones simple. Jones always wanted, he said, he really thought that there's no... He wanted people to understand, to, to land the ball short and let it run up. That reminded him of St. Andrews, no question, but... Five and fourteen. With fourteen is a different proposition. You can carry it up there if you want to, yeah. but number five, many times you have to feel like you mm-hmm. go up to it. Yeah, well, I like to. My favorite holes are always the ones where you've got the option of running the ball in, if if you want. You know? Yeah, yeah. Once Which again, is, that strategic design. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and and your favorite shots then? Yeah, well, that's that's one and number favorite. five. That is still puzzling. I, you know, it's unbelievable. We remarked yesterday. I think it was in 1995, the year I went. Jack Nicholas made two twos on number five. That's right. Yeah. That is just <laughs> unearthly. I know. Yeah. Not possible, yeah. but he did somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's always, you know, the thirteenth and the fifteenth hole. It's just so much. Uh, fifteen is elevated, and you see that green down there, and you you hope you've got the right club in your hand. I used to. I can't get there anymore, but it was always a troublesome thing to pick a club there. Mm, yeah. You yeah. want to land it just yeah. properly. I must admit that it, it's hard to imagine a better hole than the thirteenth here. Well, it, you it, know, when when it it plays the sort of when you've got the decision to make on the second shot, that that's the whole thing, isn't it? Really, it is. Yeah. It is, and uh, uh, such a daring tee shot to hit it mm. close to the corner, uh, and then the second shot. It's a little problematical. Something it plays a little more uphill than you think, mm -hmm. and elevation wise and but uh, once again, thrilling. You see some incredible things happen there, and you see some bad things happen there too, of which I've been on the other end of that. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, you play here Many long times. enough, you're gonna. Yeah, something's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and what about your favorite putts? There must be some putts on the out there that. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I once had a daydream that no one was around, and I could dump a shag bag of balls and go out to the front of number 14 okay, and just start putting and chipping up right. to that, you know, to various pin placements. Mm -hmm. It's such an unbelievable green. It's fierce. You know, people say, well, God. Reminds me a bit of the 14th at the old course. It very much and so. the You know, that big bump in the front there, right in the middle of the green, uh, middle of the fairway in front of that green is not the place to be most of the time. You want to be way out way somewhere. Right, yeah. Way right and way left. Yeah. yeah. do. And there's advantageous, like you say, on both sides of 14 as well. It's a wonder. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder, that yeah. green. So uh, just to sum it up then, um, is the golf course better now than it's ever been? Or is it Simply, has it been modified out of necessity? Well, would, it, would it have gone this way had the ball not gone stopped going as far as it does? I'll say this, John, that when I first started playing here, you know, they mowed everything. Mm. It was wall to wall. Mowed. There was no yeah. long grass at mm -hmm. all. It was just, and it was meant to be firm and fast. And if you hit an errant ball, it was liable to run into trouble. Mm -hmm. It was allowed to run into trouble. Yeah. I think that's one of the different things about it yeah. then as opposed to now. And they had, obviously, they had to do some unbelievable uh, things to the golf course to, to, to combat how far people hit it now. But I, I think... Now, to me, I did see vestiges of it yesterday. The ball was running quite a bit, and I said, "This is this is more like it <clears throat> for today's player." Because I did see vestiges of if they played a ball offline, it would start running and it would go out, which I think is the way it should play. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it would be more difficult but I, I, today. I it's. It's a bit different proposition, no question. Mm. It's just how uh, headlong changes are necessary to sort of combat the game. It's just amazing how everybody is just so long these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to see it played in the proper way, though, no question. It's the Masters, the season's first major, a tradition unlike any other, and a time for players to outperform even their own high expectations. This takes focus, commitment, and trusting the best golf ball for your game. That's why the majority at Augusta National will rely on the Titleist Pro V1 or Pro V1X. They deliver superior performance, consistency, and unrivaled control. Titleist, the number one ball at the Masters, the number one ball in golf. How much of an influence has this golf course had on your 
design philosophies. You, know, you and Bill Cure are, you know, rightly revered for some of the stuff that you've, you've designed. And it seems to me that the the strain of St Andrews Augusta runs through a lot of what you do. Well, it, it, we think about it a lot, and we only hope that it reminds people of a, a strategic golf course. Uh, one, obviously, one of our tenets is to leave things alone, leave nature alone, pick out a good piece of property, and let that dictate its problems. Highlight those, uh, what you see in the field, but always give people a chance. Uh, I've always said it's a very easy thing to make a really difficult mm. golf course. Mm. Yeah, easiest and thing in the world. not what you want. Yeah. And, and uh, once again, St. Andrews, if you think about it, a lifetime study, there's a million ways to play it. Mm-hmm. it yeah. But you, it only gets better when you know it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think, you, I mean, for my likes, I mean, I, I'm kind of the same philosophy as you when it comes to this, but I think the elimination of the exciting recovery shot is, is madness. <laughs> you know, I, I don't understand why you would ever do that, but people do. I mean, the U.S. Open, traditional U.S. Open setups completely eliminated that. Yeah, oh, very yeah and much I never so. understood that. Oh, yeah. it's, it's confining. It's confining. Yeah. And uh, a different, uh, extreme penalty, you know, after you see a shot played, and you say, well, that's. But here you always had a chance. You always had a Yeah, but, and it brings so lie. many numbers into play. I mean, if, you, if you're if you daft enough to have a go at something, <laughs> you might make an ego, but you could make eight. You know, but True. if you're pitching out, you're going to make a four or five every time. It's boring. Well, well you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's a totally different proposition. It's, it escapes people's attention, I think, when they play it for the first time. They think it's, oh, it's very, it's, it's much easier than... Hmm. By standard road, you know, thirty yard fairways, yeah. rough on either side, and uh, it's just a different way to play, different presentation. Yeah. So, what what advice do you give people? I'm sure you've been asked. They're coming here to play for the first time. What's the what's the best advice? I, I, I think I think this. Not only green, you can't play enough approach shots around and on the greens, but note how the elevation change can affect the nature of the shots. If you play downhill, there's it plays a lot shorter. Mm. Uphill plays longer, obviously, but trying to fit yourself to the actual ground itself and the slopes, uh, it's very, very difficult. Sometimes you have you feel like you're a little off balance when you're over the ball, and that's the sloping nature of the property. Yeah. Uh, Does that apply to even the top players this week? I I think so. I think you can. Always work on your balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, But learning those shots takes a lifetime. Although Fuzzy Zeller proved us wrong. Well, there's always an exception that proves the rule. (laughs) It's like when they do what I do for a living, the number of sentences that started with, with the exception of Jack Nicholas, comma. (laughs) (laughs) He he didn't even count. I always think of a line that Jack always used in preparation. For many, many years, he'd tell the press, the Greens are approaching tournament speeds. (laughs) Something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, anyway. Um, what do you expect to see this week? I mean, what are you looking forward to? Uh, I think uh, someone who keeps emotions uh, intact. It's hard to do. I, I, I must say, Scotty Scheffler, the way that he plays, he's got a great arsenal, but it seems to be a very even demeanor. Mm. It seems like not much bothers him. Mm-hmm. And uh, that pays dividends around here. Uh, but I think the youth of the game and people who don't know much about certain young players, wow, there's some there's some unbelievable, mm. unbelievable kids coming up. Uh, it has, it, the week sort of uh, reveals itself in these youthful players, and they'll, they're, they're coming to the front, mm. people from around the world. Yeah. At the other end of that scale, um, I think one of the great things that I think Augusta National gets right is the fact that the likes of yourself and I bumped into Ian Woosnam and Marco Mira in the space of 20 minutes this morning and Tom Watson was standing right there and, you know, 
and Fuzzy Zeller walked past. <laughs> that to me, is, I'm at an age where that sort of means more, I think. But still, I think it's really important that that you know that you're it, here it, you know, it, uh, to uh, tell us stories like you're doing it this morning. You know, well, it's uh, it's a fraternity. It's a it's a combination of knowing each other and playing against them and learning the game, watching the game. And we're only just too thankful to be in that room up there. I mean, I look around there every time we start the Champions Dinner. I look for people from around the world. Mm. We have the Spanish, great f- Spanish flavor this yep. year. Mm-hmm. You can look forward to some paella. Too. Oh, my gosh. It's, <laughs> what an extensive menu. Yeah. And then you see Jose Maria Olathabal and you see Sergio. And you just John Rahm is just such prodigious, mm. prodigious mm. talent. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody goes through the ball mm. any stronger or more forceful than 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 him. Yeah, he just unbelievable, back. <laughs> and he doesn't take it back too far either. No, it's, but God, yeah. he gives it a thrash. Yeah, yeah. Great how, man, how, well, I'm going to ask you this because it's on the and it's. I think people would be interested in in what your thoughts are. Um, what do you think of live golf? I, I just. Someone with my vintage, the way that we played our whole careers, <clears throat> in a four-round competition, meaningful. Um, I, uh, competition is is different than wherever you go around the world. It's a it's a it's a tournament and has finality to it. And yeah. You play against great players, but. It's a different way, and I'm not saying distasteful, that's not it, but I don't like it that friendships go by the wayside, mm. and I just don't like it's not good for the game in that in that respect. I don't know. I don't know if it'll ever get together with the PGA Tour or the European Tour or wherever you play. Mm. I just don't know. It's, Does the source of the money bother you in a, on a moral aspect? I, I, I've said this before on here, but the I thought the the mistake that Jay Monaghan made originally w- was to make it a moral issue, and not treat it as a business. It was like the Godfather. It's not personal. It's a bu- it's a business yeah. decision. That and to me, because if you take it down the moral avenue, you're kind of stuck. You can't change your morals, but you can change your mind in business. And how do, how do you the feel about that whole scenario? Thing, and the money's one thing, and it's totally something that nobody's ever seen. But obviously, they've been successful in other other endeavors in sport. Uh, I, I golf's a traditional game, and uh, I, I don't like it that that part of it's changed. You, you you want to reward the best, and it's the money part of it is uh, to a lot of people the biggest part of it. Mm. I, I don't know. It's but just it, not it, different. It's but not it the way we learn. But the Saudi, you know, what goes on there, that, that you, can't, you would dis- distance yourself from that. I mean, yeah, I think well, if you're you in business, I think you have to. Yeah, you, you just can't. Yeah. There's no monetary-wise, There's, there's you're going to lose in that game. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> no mean, question yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, Jay Monaghan was right about that. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. You always want to see the health of the sport continue. You don't want to see anything threaten it. Mm-hmm. Would you like to see it over, basically? Is, well, is, there a way, is there a way back? I mean, if you, I'm going to put you in charge, you're uh, king for a day. <laughs> what, what would be your solution to where we are right now? I think you really have to sit down hard on both sides and say, look, what, what are we trying to do? You're going to have to compromise both of yeah. them, aren't they? Yeah. I, I don't know whether that's going to happen. Who knows? But the two sides need to meet and know what know what they're into and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. How it's affecting people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do wonder, as they say, without compromise, that there's no easy solution. No. They're going to have to bite the bullet, both of them, both sides. So, I don't know. Anyway, it, it remains to be seen. Anyway, we're moving along here. I'm, I'm, I was intrigued by this. I hadn't quite realised um, how much I want to play you in a playoff, Ben, because your playoff record is... <laughs> Is absolutely appalling. <laughs> You've never won any. Spotless. You've lost. Spotless. Lost every one. I need an explanation <laughs> for this. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost in a million different ways. I yeah. say. Uh, 
guys have played better. I've completely blown up. It, it's crazy. Not one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, zero for oh and eight. eight. Yeah, oh and eight. Yeah, it's appalling. Spotless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say much for that, John. No, I mean, um, but you know, the, on the other side of the coin, let's say, <laughs> on the plus side, you you how much pleasure do you get from winning something like the Irish Open? Oh, I mean that that kind of shows you game can travel. You know, I I played with John Carr yesterday, my old right. friend. Yeah. And his brother was Roddy. I played with Roddy, yeah. and this was 1976 yeah. at Port Marnock. And uh, I got to meet the great Joe Carr. Mm. And then what a wonderful man he mm. was. He he had the best physique I've ever seen. He was stood straight up, just wonderful, eight-time British amateur champion. Mm. And uh, to win on that golf course was just amazing. Uh, I There was a guy that chased us down the stretch, and he was a hurling player. His name was Jimmy Kinsella. Yes, I remember him. You, yeah, he played he, the European yeah, Tour. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was, was a hurling player He was the pro at well. or somewhere like that, yeah. Yeah, so, I remember I got, I got a note from one of his friends the other day, and I said, yeah, hell yes, I remember Jimmy Kinsella. We played together at Port Marnock. Um, it was so much fun. And I, I came back the following year, and Hubert Green – Beat me. Mm-hmm. I finished second to him, but it was, Port Marnock was wonderful. Yeah. Got to meet the great Harry Bradshaw mm. yeah, yeah. back then. So you meet all these characters. Christy O'Connor, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Christy. I played now, with Christy. Yeah, now here's, there's an apocryphal, possibly apocryphal story that goes around that, that uh, it's attributed to you about <laughs> playing a practice round with Christy in Ireland at one of those events. And he's in the middle of, you're in the middle of the fairway, 150 yards or whatever, and you say to Chrissy, well, what club should I hit here? <laughs> and he then goes through the bag from driver to putter and hits everyone <laughs> on the green. Is there any truth to that? It well, sounds, he, I'd like Christ, it to be true. He, Christy's one of those players that just played the game, played with his hands. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. And you, uh, yeah, I think he played that shot with a, a, a few clubs. Mm. Right. In other words, you you dummy, what are you, yeah, what exactly. are you yeah. even asking yeah. me for? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. which was great. He's, uh, he played well all over the world. Mm-hmm. He was a great player, great player, but wonderful man. <laughs> but He could drink. I was, very, <laughs> he, yeah, I was very, very young and knew nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you did well, all when right you, when mean, you start playing links golf. You start to learn. Yeah. Pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I was to, a betting man, you know, early on would have looked at you and thought, well, this kid's going to have a chance of winning Masters the way he putts, <laughs> and also your your kind of feeling for the game and the way you played outside the putting would have suggested the Open would have been the most likely one for you to win. Well, I tried to learn in watching yeah. people, uh, and but yeah, no, no, the way I played, the more comfortable in certain situations I was. So there were certain uh, tournaments that I could possibly excel. Mm-hmm. What were your best chances? Uh, I, I had I, the Open Open Championship, uh, nineteen seventy nine at Royal Lytham. I thought you might uh, mention that Seve mm-hmm. Seve outplayed us. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I had a well, we, a bunch of us finished second in 1978 at St Andrews. Mm-hmm. I played, but you know, so I played with Aoki four days in a row there. Really? We had a ball yeah. together to watch his yeah. short game. How was, he, how was his English? Not point? bad. Yeah, I could okay. get along with right. him, but he was an old friend from Japan. But to watch him, he loved playing at St Andrews. He could hit all these shots mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Uh, Turnberry, I was leading the last, going into the last day, and Tom Watson just killed everybody. Uh, made a lot of mistakes, but I come, came close there and came close in the PGA and the U.S. Open. But always, always thought that my best chances to win a major was here, and thank goodness it did. Yeah, is that your biggest regret that you didn't win an Open or another yeah, major? Yeah, I really. Want I mean, you obviously to lost a playoff at the PGA as well. So. Yes, yeah, one of those yeah. eight playoffs. You know, <laughs> it was one of those zero. <laughs> <laughs> that was this Sorry. morning. But uh, no, I I would have loved to have won the Open Championship, and that's. And my friend Tom Watson's five and oh, should have been six, mm, but, which yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Hot. Yeah, I can still. But he's the kind of player who 
Yeah, I mean, he excelled in it. Yeah, he he, so he didn't mind the weather. You know, he just I've heard him quoted on this. He just he didn't worry about the wind. He just tried to hit the ball solidly. Yes, you know, that that was his philosophy. And I played with him at Port Rush. That's one of his favorite courses. Before one of the opens, and went out, and it was just a vile, vile day, <laughs> and I'm just suffering. And it was about the twelfth hole. I said, Tom. Don't you think we ought to go in? And he goes, yeah, isn't this great? And I said, well, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, That's, it does help. Oh, know. God. Yeah. Yeah. But he hit it solid. Yeah. But the reason I asked that was that I've written down here that you were, you were second in five majors before you won one. And that was what led to my asking you, was, your, was a little bit of frustration setting yeah, in? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I was getting close. Mm -hmm. I was getting close and getting frustrated. And as I said, in 1984, when I won here, I kept – kept things together, kept my emotions. It wasn't so much up and down like I usually do. I was always up and emotional mm. and getting mad and try things, cost you a lot of different ways to debilitate to yourself. Uh, but I, you do, you, a golfer never knows. I, I was beginning to wonder, no question. Mm hmm yeah, if you I mean, don't see it. It doesn't. But but things happen for a, you know, almost for a reason. My mind always goes to that putt you hold on the tenth green in eighty four. Oh, Ridiculous. <laughs> I, I look at that and I say, how in the heck did I ever hold this putt? Yeah. And I really would have killed for a two putt because mm. I didn't want to drop any shots. And I, it was so weird. I birdied, I think eight and nine that day, and faced this putt. And I said, well, I, you know. Don't drop a shot now. Get this two putt. And somehow it went in. I was so excited I had to calm down for two holes. Mm, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Do you remember who you played with that day? Uh, I I played with uh, uh, the young boy. I'll think of it in a minute. He, oh. He did all right. I played with Nick Faldo the first time, 84, and I played with, I'll, I'll think of it. I can see him. I was talking about eighty four. It was absolutely oh, yeah. Nick Faldo. That was yeah, Nick Faldo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I think that he Sandy Lyle said the same thing. He played with Jack Nicholas when Jack won in eighty six in the last round. And Faldo I think learned from watching how you did. You know, what you the things that you did to win. You know, the people they can learn a lot if they pay attention, I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. Does it seem like a long time ago? Forty years. Yeah, forty years is, is <laughs> a lifetime. Uh, my, you know, it's, it, it's funny. My father used to play in this tournament in South Texas. And then they called it "Life Begins at 40. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, but to think back, I, when I when I was playing nine holes yesterday, just for fun, I, I walked around here and I said, "How lucky am I?" to join these guys in that champion's room to be able to play here and think about where you've done, what you've done, and to think about being a champion the rest of your life is is something else. Mm. Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to know what goes on inside that room with the dinner. I mean, and you guys are the only ones who ever know, so it's just how it should be. And there's certain eras that you know, yeah. I, I can tell you this. I can tell your listeners that Sam Sneed – told the filthiest jokes I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. yeah. And I, it was enough that he told a couple, and Byron Nelson would stand up and he yeah. said, that's enough, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. But to see it all happen unfold. Yeah. Well, Ian Wisdom told me one this morning that you could never repeat on air somewhere. So, you know, he, he, oh, said, no. he told it close. at the dinner once, he said. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Boy, part of it. Boys. That I should know. be part of it. Yeah. 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 So. But it, it's... It will be fun. It'll be fun tomorrow night to listen to John and to be proud of his Spanish heritage and to be proud of his fellow cohorts who won the champion, mm. to, who were in that room. Six with him. green jackets now between them. Spaniards. That's right. And to, in a, in a way, to honor Seve as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big thing for him last year. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, he, he's missed, isn't he? I mean, we, I speak as a European for once, you know, the, the, he was the leader of everything. Oh. He was the first one that came over here and won 
and showed the rest of them that it could be done kind of thing. Oh, you know? yeah. He was, he was magical. Mm. Just magical. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, spend a few minutes before we we finish, Ben, on the, talking about the Ryder Cup. It's it's twenty five years now since you were captain. Yeah. Ridiculous week, by the way. Oh God! I, I can still see you wagging, <laughs> wagging your finger. Oh. You know, I've got. What made you say that? Because <clears throat> it didn't look good. Let's let's be I honest. Yeah, I don't. And there's certain things that were happening that yeah. I don't just I don't know. It just was a feeling that something told me that was. We we're going to be all right there. Something's going to come out in the plus column. I'm thinking had to do. I kept thinking about Francis. We met, mm. and how many th- unbelievable things happened yeah. to him yeah. with well, the playoff course, with yeah. Varden and Ray. Yeah. That I and on that golf course, mm. I don't know. There was something about that course mm-hmm. that I thought that course yeah, was well, going to... Well, right. I mean, it's a great sadness in, in a way, I think, and you probably share this, is that the the fantastic golf that your team played on the Sunday got kind of lost in the midst of all the stampeding across greens and right. stuff. I know. You know. I know. I, 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 just, there was something about that course I thought it was going to take care of us. And I saw some things that you were completely out of the ordinary and then that happened on 17. And to happen to Jose Maria Olathabal, who's mm-hmm. whom we all love. Uh, Do you ever look back on I, that now? And I th- I've asked but that was before. the damnedest. I mean, nobody in the world would think that that putt was going to go in no. for him. Oh, I know. Yeah, we we lost collect. We lost our brains. Yeah. Do you ever look back and think, you know, this would have been a big call and a brave call that you, if you'd gone and said, right, pick it up. You can't putt after that. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I. And you might have been the one man who could have done it, you know, the way that you feel about the game. No, so we know, lost it's it. It's a we big lost question, it. but. <laughs> no, well, we, we lost it, and we, it was something that we had to apologize for. Mm-hmm. We, we plainly lost it. Nobody ever. Yeah, I mean. It was I, such I, a shock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, mm-hmm. no. It was yeah, it was a shame yeah. in the way that the the golf got kind of lost in the midst of all that, you know. And I, I speak as somebody who was partly responsible because I wrote about it as well, and I wrote about the stampede before I wrote about the great golf, you know. Well, it, yeah, that's understandable when you when you got away from it and you say, well, that's, that was not clearly not right. Mm. How, how do you look back on your your playing career in the Ryder Cup? Because again. Not the uh-huh. greatest record. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. You keep bringing this up, but <laughs> I need, that, no, I need I some my, explanation for that. I had a few good moments, but largely yeah. I was I was not a great contributor. Let's say no. no I, that the, the game with Eamon Darcy that was just well, took the well. I, to explain so, for the people who are listening that you broke your putter. Uh, I did in the singles at Muirfield Village in '87. Yeah, how, how did that happen? Just I, I three putted the sixth green there, and I was so mad, of course. And I, I went off the edge of the green, and there was this, this, you know, in Ohio they have these Buckeye trees. They have mm. these Buckeye nuts, so I just tapped it pretty good with my putter head and the, <laughs> and the shaft broke and I went oh my god now what I'll never forget going up to the seventh tee and uh, or or the next hole eighth hole I putted with a sand wedge on the next hole and walked up with the eighth tee Jack Nicholas comes up he said how's it going and I said under my breath I, said, oh, I broke my putter back there he just looked at me and said what yeah. And I said, well, he said, well, the way things are going, I don't blame you. <laughs> but Eamon, Eamon later said, he said, I, I thought Ben was what, was trying to slow the ball on the on the green. They were so fast. I right. thought he was trying to slow the ball right. down. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up putting with a one iron. You didn't put too badly. And, and, and made a couple of putts, <laughs> carried him to the end. Yeah. But Eamon and I always laugh about that. He made a great putt on yeah, the last hole to beat me. He did. Stuffed yeah. me out. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you explain? I mean, it's an obvious explanation is that they had some great players. But the the Europeans have won so many Ryder Cups when, on paper, the, their team hasn't been as good as the American team. But they, they've you know they've won far more than you would expect. I mean, is there an explanation uh, for this? No, I've always just thought that they played better together mm. uh than than we do as a whole over the 
past history of the Ryder Cup, we're more we're more sort of individualists, let's say. But a team aspect and knowing what to do is that's I'd say y'all's end is much better mm-hmm. from a long track record than ours. You know, we it, they the Europeans have unlocked the code, and you can see it. You see it in the women's too. Uh, collectively, mm. it, it's a it's a tough thing to break. No well, question. In their minds, they're always the underdogs, which I think helps in a way because they, they they're playing for a cause. Mm-hmm. And the Americans, conversely, then get on the defensive because they're seen as the favourites. And they well, man, if we lose here again, we're going to get slaughtered in the right. media and all that stuff. Skewered, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's it's all part of it's it. It's fascinating. It's a fantastic contest. Yeah. There's nothing better you than match know. play, of course. No. You know, you know, so. No. Just to get an insight into somebody's soul, you know. Oh, exactly. You know. Bernard Darwin always he said, "What did he say?" He said, uh, "Match play, or I can't remember who it was. Match play is 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 is, is, is like I, I, I'm trying to remember how, how he said it. it was perfect." Wow. Metal, metal plates for score. I'm just impressed that you're the first person on any of these podcasts, for a former player who's been able to quote Bernard Darwin. I'm just oh, I'm he impressed was, enough with I, that. I think <laughs> he's far and away the best writer. I've, I, it's unbelievable to to see what he wrote about architecture, players. He he wrote with such emotion. You know, he he'd always chastise him, himself. Mm-hmm. But you had to you you wait to read his books. You had to have a thesaurus next to you. Yeah, it's <laughs> just beautiful yeah. language. Yeah, yeah. Funny. Yeah, dry wit. The British droll wit. Yeah. Just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to end up, um, Ben. You're the yeah, the champions dinner. It's a kind of ultimate boys club, which is slightly ironic for a man who who lives with a. <laughs> By all these women <laughs> you're the only male in the house you're right <laughs> what's that like what's the contrast like with that oh I, that's I, it's a it's a chance to to get out and be with now be with careful guys now. that you that you just absolutely love and love to be together and then you know, the same night, Julie, my wife, has she has a little club over there off to the side with some of the champions' wives. Oh, uh, tomorrow night? Yes. Oh, okay. so, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's kind of fun that way, too. Uh, but no, I, I live a – I'd kind of do what I'm told, <laughs> and I need, I need to. And it, <laughs> we had uh, – uh, I have I have three wonderful daughters, wonderful daughters, and I'm my youngest is getting married in September, mm-hmm. and uh, you know I it's I've thought about this for a few weeks, and I said Julie, I tell you what, I, I could I could say in the Champions Day, you know, uh, my youngest is getting married in September, and I could ask John Rom for a loan. <laughs> Maybe I can get a loan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you got your speech ready? <laughs> I've got a lot of things together yeah. pretty pretty well. Yeah. Jackie Burke stories and right. the reasons why we're in there. We just just enjoy each other and uh Jackie Burke was great. I I, oh. I went to Champions once to interview him when uh he was we talked about the he was captain of the Ryder Cup in Muirfield in nineteen seventy three and I got him talking about that and some of the <laughs> stories were he was so funny. Oh. You know, he had no respect. He just treated them all, you know, like school children almost. <laughs> yes. And Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer, I don't care who you are, you know, sort of thing. He was brilliant. He's a cat. Oh. He's a cat. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. It's, uh... No, we'll have fun. Anyway, and uh, I want to finish off by saying that you're, you've just turned 72, which I refer to as level fours. And level level fours. So how do you feel about the, the future for Ben Crenshaw? What's left? Oh, uh, well, I... I'm... Very happy to, to, you know, apart from other things about my wife and family, but I, I've got the most wonderful business partner in the world, Bill Coor, mm-hmm. who not many people know, uh, but he's 
You know, it's ironic that Julie and I got married 37 years ago, and Bill and I formed a partnership 37 years ago. But he's uh, we've had so much fun. We've, we've had so many happy moments building courses, and, and uh, we've been fortunate to build in lovely places. Uh, and we only hope that people enjoy what we do. Uh, but it's... Uh, um, it's it's with a lot of fun and respect about what came before us, what goes into trying to make a good golf course, but I'm very thankful for that. Mm. Is that how you want to be remembered? Yeah. Providing fun for people? Yeah. More than your playing career? Yeah, I think it probably lasts longer than your... Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a lasting thing. Mm. You put something on the ground and it's there. Yeah. How, how do you look? Very last question. How, how do you look back on your career? Oh, I'd like to ask people the, where, relative to par. Where were you? In the uh, end? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I'm. I was under par sometimes, but I couldn't always hold it. I was maybe close to par. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were, you were for better. You were fine until the playoff. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me in a playoff. <laughs> <laughs> ben, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure talking you're, to you. You're, you're welcome. You're a great it's man. It's been thank a great you. fun. Always. We always have good yeah. talks. And I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Yeah. Very, thank you. Cheers. Cheers.